with me this morning, if you would, and uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and uh, we're going to kind of draw a conclusion, if you will, to uh, the conversation that Paul's been having here. We've talked about uh, marriage, we've talked about divorce and remarriage, we've talked about being single, and this is kind of the, the wrap on it, and I know that I've got the title being about singleness, but there's a few other things that, that he's going to touch on uh, in here, and I think that they're, they're very good for us. Now, you probably have heard uh, the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, all right? Uh, I, I like that. Uh, you, you hear people say that, you know, and, and you understand what that means. It means that you have some kind of discontentment, and, and you think if your situation was a little bit different, it'd be better. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the writer Irma Bombeck. She actually wrote a book entitled, The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. And uh, you know what? A lot of times that's uh, that's really true. And, uh, you know, I've heard that in ministry that, uh, you know, the the, the preacher that's going to the church is uh, is looking at that and he's seeing the green pasture, which you got to realize is the preacher that left the church, he was seeing that as a barren wasteland, all right? So there's that, that balance in there, all right? But like field cows, we, we poke our heads past the, the barbed wire boundaries in order to graze in another pasture where the grass seems so much greener, the grass tastes so much better than where we are. But if you stop and you look down the fence, the cattle on the other side of the fence are sticking their heads through to eat your grass, and, and so you, you come up with a situation that's just kind of, kind of, kind of weird like that. It's it, the bottom line is we have sometimes dissatisfied souls. You've uh, you've heard them in relationships, husbands and wives up to their elbows in garage grease, dirty dishes, Legos, Tinker Toys, saying something like this: "If I only had a little bit more time to myself, then I could accomplish my goals." Then. I would really feel worthwhile. And just down the street are the single people settling into their careers and their, their dreams. They're home at 5.30 every night to a, a dinner of lean cuisine standing at the kitchen counter, uh, listening to the evening news, wishing they had someone to have dinner with and someone else's voice to hear besides the talking hairdo that's on TV. Uh, you know, they, they, they're just wishing they had something different. Too many look at their lives and see only the weeds. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 40, Paul encourages us to take a look at the green grass instead. He advises those on both sides of the fence to, uh, especially singles here, but to stay where they are and graze contentedly. Graze contentedly. Paul's advice, uh, you know, it's, a big, it's a big thing now in, uh, in preaching to uh, have a big idea, all right? So here it is. You ready? This is Paul's, Paul's big idea here is, uh, to, in a nutshell, these words, staying unmarried is desirable, but it isn't demanded. That's, that's the big idea, the first part of, of our sermon here this morning. Uh, he, and then what he does is he goes on to list some advantages of being single. He backs up his point with four advantages. So there's your clue if you're taking notes this morning in this first section. There's going to be four sub points. Um, advantages that single parent people, single people have that perhaps married people don't. And although his thoughts are not necessarily drawn from Jesus' teaching, they have been revealed uh, to Paul by the Holy Spirit, and they are good for us to hang on to, good for us to think through. So we begin by reading chapter 7 in verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commands of the Lord, but I give my opinion uh, as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. So there Paul says, I'm going to lay some things out for you here, and uh, they are trustworthy, all right? Number one is simply this. Singles will encounter less distress from a hostile world. Singles will encounter less distress from a hostile world. Now let's add verse 26 onto there, what Paul was saying. He says, I think that this is a good in view of the present distress 
that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, even though persecution was sporadic and localized in Paul's day, he believed that it was only a matter of time before Christians throughout the entire Roman Empire would suffer for this faith. And, and by the way, he was right. Uh, over uh, 10 years after, or about 10 years after he wrote 1 Corinthians, the Roman Emperor Nero falsely blamed Christians for setting the imperial city on fire. He slaughtered believers of all ages. One rampage followed another, uh, spilling over into Rome's city limits into the rest of the empire. Uh, persecution of Christians at this point was horrible. Uh, I was doing some uh, research here, and I came across a passage in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Listen to what John Fox writes here. They were punished with stripes, scourgings, drawings. And by the way, if you don't know what that is, that's being drawn and quartered. They literally would tie you to four horses and send the horses off in four different directions, okay? Uh, tearing, stonings, plates of iron laid upon them burning hot, deep dungeons, the rack, strangulation in prison, the teeth of wild beasts, gridirons, gallows, tossing upon the horns of bulls. Moreover, when they were thus killed, their bodies were laid in heaps, and the dogs were left there to protect them so that no one could get to them and bury them. That's the kind of persecution that Paul said it's coming. All right? Now, you say, what does that have to do with us? Well, just think about this for a second. It, it's really difficult for us to get our heads around uh, this whole idea of, of persecution to the point of stoning, uh, scourgings, dungeon, the rack, that kind of thing. Um, and and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a parenthesis right here and say, you better start paying attention. Okay, because I'm, I'm with Paul, it, it ain't too far off, all right? So that being said, let me get back here. And the, the 20th century hardships that we usually face are things like the loss of a job, reputation, uh, possibly a mate or a child. It is because believers still face the brunt of the world's hostility that, that Christ... Uh, toward Christ, that Paul's advice to singles applies to us today. You see, uh, suffering alone is difficult enough, but watching your mate or your child suffer, it, it's unbearable. I, I mean, it literally chokes me up to even think about being in a situation where I would have to see my wife or one of my kids be put to death for their faith in Christ. It just, it, sorry. It ought to do something to you. Paul's advice is to stay. If you're single, stay on your side of the fence. If you're already married, stay on your side of the fence. But if you're single, the threat of persecution and hardship, that alone is, is, is reason enough to remain single. So you don't have to carry that, that burden. You don't have to carry that, 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 that heart-wrenching experience that may happen. Okay, Number two... Singles will experience fewer difficulties on a personal level. Because Paul's emphasis is so strong here in, in, in valuing the opportunity to stay single, many of the Corinthians began to think that marriage was sinful. So Paul goes on to say to them here in, uh, in verse 27 and 28, he said, Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet, such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. Many unmarried people look at singleness and only see the weeds. But a large number of divorces today is a telltale sign that marriage does not automatically provide some kind of ideal situation, some ideal perfect green pasture. Because if you're here this morning and you're married, you know that marriage is hard work. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. And if you think that it is, you come see me, because I'm going to smack you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Certainly, marriage yields rewards, but the price can also be costly. 
it increases our responsibility. It calls for a readjustment of finances. I have a single son. If you'd like his phone number, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and he called me not too long ago, and he said, hey, I got an opportunity to buy a rifle. He, what should I do? I said, can you afford it? He said, yes. I said, buy it. Because the day is going to come, if you get married, son, that those priorities get changed in a heartbeat. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, it might be a shotgun for a guy or a bow or a crossbow. Uh, it might be a sewing machine or a serger or something else for the ladies. One of them fancy schmancy mixers that does everything but fold your clothes, you know. Uh, a lot of times those things have to go by the wayside because there's other responsibility. Um, there's a readjustment in finances. There's a readjustment in leisure time. Yeah, we'll just leave that one alone. And then there's a readjustment in personal goals. But more than anything else, it grinds, marriage grinds against our selfishness. Amen? Oh, you guys are so spiritual. <laughs> well, you, you can't admit you're selfish? Man, I am. I want what I want. And, and the biggest conflicts that Lynn and I run into are when I want what I want, she wants what she wants, and we're ready to square off about it. All right? We, we, we're, we're ready to argue. We're ready to, to, to see who's going to win out. Man, I'll tell you what. Marriage will show you your selfish side so fast, it'll make your head spin. Amen? Amen. The single life confronts our egos and uh, without the struggle of a mate it just adds to our egos I'll tell you what I was having a conversation with somebody here not too long ago a single person and uh, you know I said something about you know the future and blah 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 and marriage and oh my word I got a doctoral dissertation about the blessing of being single and about following hard John after God's will like we've been talking about in your Sunday school class and all of that. And, and I'm, my hair, I hadn't got much, but it was blown straight back. Yeah. And, and I got done, I went, I'm sorry. Wow. Number three, singles experience fewer distractions. Look at uh, verses 29 here and on. But this I say, brethren, the time has to be shortened so that from now on those, thing, those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as if they did not possess. Verse 31, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of the world is passing away. That's a lot in there, but here's what Paul's getting at. He says in verse 29, the time has been shortened, probably referring to the time before the rapture. Now, here's an interesting thing. In every generation, every preacher has just about come to the idea that we're living in the last days and we better get ready for the rapture. Amen? Okay? And, and we're no different, are we? I mean, you look around at what's going on around in, in the world today and, and you just have to say... Better pack your bags because the time is getting shorter. It hasn't ever changed, okay? And, and it may be uh, a thousand years from now. And if Jesus hasn't returned and the rapture hasn't taken place, preachers are going to be preaching and saying, you better get ready because it looks like it could happen at any moment. All right? And so this morning, I'm going to just tell you, you better get ready because it looks like it could happen at any moment. Now, I fulfilled my duty as a, as a pastor, all right? But that's what Paul's saying here. The form of this world passing away in verse 31, the earth is deteriorating while it is awaiting the destruction and recreation by God that's talked about in Romans 8, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21. Do you realize that all the stuff that we have, and I did a, I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I did a big thing about stuff. People got stuff. You got stuff. I got stuff. We got stuff. All right? And afterwards, somebody came up and he said, you know, you better be thankful for other people's stuff. And I said, why is that? He said, because you'd still be walking down here from Clear Lake with one bag at a time if it weren't for other people's stuff. So praise God, all right? 
we, we love other people's stuff, and we love it when people let us use their stuff, but we all got stuff. But here's the bottom line. No matter how good your stuff is or how bad your stuff is, there's coming a day when it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. That's, that's what it says it's in Second Peter, that, that everything that we know of on this earth is going to be burned with a great fervent fire, and then God's going to rebuild it all, Romans, or, uh, uh, Revelation 21, all right? And so we, we understand that. So all the stuff we have. Now, what's interesting is how tenaciously we hold on to it as we live our lives. We hang on to our stuff. We're distracted. We're distracted. So understood together, these two verses tell us that Christians invest their time in eternal matters, for the time is brief and the world is corrupt. You know, this would be, a, instead of saying amen, this would be a good place for somebody to go, shocker. Yeah, the, the end, is, time is brief, amen? Scripture says your life is but a vapor, all right? It's here and it's gone. And here's a shocker, the world is corrupt. Whoa, who would have thought, right? So Paul's putting that together, and he says, singles experience fewer distractions. For those whose time is wrapped up in family and pleasure and possessions, oftentimes we are distracted from spiritual priorities. And Paul's simply saying that, that, that if you're single, you may not have that same thing going on. Number four here is uh, singles experience a greater focus on their relationship with God. Married couples are rightly concerned about cultivating their marriages. I, as a pastor, am, am very concerned that my wife and I are cultivating our marriage relationship. As your pastor, I am very concerned that you, as a husband and wife, are cultivating your marriage relationship. It is so important. And, and as part of that, you have to put your spouse's needs ahead of your own, and you are trying to meet those needs and, and those desires and all those kind of things. The unmarried, on the other hand, are able to give their undivided attention to the Lord. Look at what Paul says here, beginning in verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord and how he may please the Lord, but the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how he may please his wife. Verse um, 34 here. Uh, and his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about things of the Lord, that she may be holy in her body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how she may please her husband. Those verses don't need a whole lot of explanation. If you're here this morning and you're married, you realize that part of being married is that you set aside your own selfish wants and desires, and your main focus is to meet the needs and desires of your spouse. And in a good marriage that's really working well, if both husband and wife are setting aside their own selfish wants and desires and trying to meet the other's needs, then everything will get taken care of. Amen? All the needs are going to get met because you're not concerned about your own needs, you're only concerned about your spouse's needs. All right? So everybody's just concentrating on, on taking care of the other person and, and in, in that, your own needs will get met, and, and you're good to go, all right? So Paul is, is writing here, and he says, listen, husbands have to be concerned about pleasing their wives. Wives have to be concerned about pleasing their husbands. That's simply part of the process. Now, to clear up any misunderstanding, he brings out the ultimate goal here in verse 35. I say to you, or I say this, I say for your own benefit, not to put restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to God. Paul says, I've laid this out, not so you'd be confused, not so you'd feel overwhelmed, not so you'd be burdened. But he says here, I laid out that which is, uh, and, and promote what is appropriate to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. He's laid those things out so that those who are single 
are able to understand their opportunity that they have for rock-solid devotion to follow after God without any of the kind of distractions that those of us who are married, and by the way, I'm not saying that wives and husbands are a distraction for following hard after God. It's a whole different bit. But right here, Paul's addressing singles, okay? So, and again, earlier he said, I'm not saying it's sinful, all right? So that covers the sin, or the, it covers the sinful. That covers the singles, all right? Now, Paul goes into another little section here, and uh, uh, this is somewhat appropriate for me because uh, I, I have a daughter that's unmarried. And uh, this, is, this is kind of an interesting thing here. Let, let me just read the passage, and we'll go back and kind of unpack it a little bit here. But uh, beginning in verse 36. But if any man thinks he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she has passed her youth, and if must be so, let him do as he wishes he does not sin. Let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. Verse 38. So then both he who gives his virgin daughter into marriage does well, and he who does not give her into marriage uh, will do better. You say, wow. Do you, you remember... Uh, I believe it's, it's in 1 Peter, where Peter's writing, and, and he's talking about Paul, and he says, sometimes Paul writes some hard stuff. I don't know if he had this in mind or not, but sometimes you read stuff like this, and you're just like, what? Well, let's back up a little bit and get some, some cultural context, if you will. In the Jewish culture of that day, parents, and particularly fathers, had a dominant role in deciding... Uh, whom their children would marry. The same general custom uh, appears in many ancient societies, including that society around Rome. Some historians credit Rome's decline in part to the weakening of the family because of loss of parental control for arranged marriages. Now, let me back up here. Parentheses. Pastor is not necessarily endorsing arranged marriages amen close all right back okay uh, i'm simply telling you what the history is in new testament times arranged marriages especially for young people were the norm and in light of this teaching about the advantages of singleness some of the fathers in corinth had dedicated their young daughters to the lord as permanent virgins there was a problem with that because when the daughters got older and became of marriageable age, many of them, without doubt, wanted to be married. Well, now we got a problem. Because their fathers were in a quandary. Should they break the vow they made for the girl? It is likely that the girls did not have uh, perhaps, you know, this, this singleness uh, and they were struggling with their desires to be married, their desires to, to, to please their father, to please the Lord. You know, when, when, you know, guys, you know what it's like if you got a daughter? And you're holding her and you're looking at her. So I'll kill a guy who wants to marry you. You know, when Daniel uh, went down to, to visit Maggie the first time and, and uh, Maggie's dad said, I'm going to have Daniel sit on the north end of the couch. The north end of the couch was right next to the gun cabinet. And he said, then I'm going to take out the 12 gauge and I'm going to start cleaning it. And she, Maggie said, Dad, don't do that. All right, well, guys, you understand that. We're pretty protective of our girls. We kind of like them. Well, in this culture, the, the dad would make a vow that, that his little girl, well, she's going to be a permanent virgin for the Lord. Except that when she grew up, maybe that wasn't God's will for her life. Maybe that was not her desire. Maybe when she grew up, she wanted to get married and have kids. Not so different than our own girls. As long as they're 35, I got no problem with that. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Um, the problem was 
mentioned here among the things that Paul was talking about. Again, the emphasis is on the option of the believers that they have in regard to marriage. The intended partner is a Christian. Marriage is always permissible for the believer. The father who had vowed his daughter remaining single in order to serve the Lord more devotedly was, Paul is saying here, he's more than free to change his mind. After all, the vow is made for somebody else. Think of it like this. For those of you that have kids, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could accept Jesus for our kids? Amen? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I didn't say it was possible. You guys are really scared of me this morning, all right? Listen, it doesn't work that way. God doesn't have any grandkids. He has kids. And so every one of our children need to come to that place where they recognize their need and they accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, amen? amen. You can't make a vow for somebody else. It doesn't work that way. And that's what, what, what Paul is getting at here. Now, he also goes down here a little bit further, and he says, Now, if a father stands firm in his heart, that is, he doesn't change his mind about the promise, and he's under no constraint by the daughter to change his mind. In other words, he says, I don't want to change my mind. And she says, I don't care if you change your mind or not. It's good and pure and motive, and he has authority over his own will. As deeply committed, decided in his own heart, that he may keep his own daughter a virgin. Only... If the daughter's willingness to keep her vow should cause the father to change his mind. So, in other words, as long as daughter and daddy are agreed, it's all good. But if they're disagreed, there's nothing wrong for the father to release his daughter of that vow and allow her to get married as long as she marries a believer. Amen? Whew. You guys wore out yet? Paul writes some hard things. His steadfastness and his vow will encourage her, his daughter, to be steadfast in her vow. And in that, they do well. Paul repeats the option. Look here again in verse 39. He who, or excuse me, in verse 38, he says, So then, he who gives both his virgin daughter to marriage does well. He who does not give her to marriage uh, does well. Uh, uh, better, good and better. It's, it's not, here's, here's the thing. As with singles themselves, the choice between right, this is not a choice between right and wrong, it's a choice between good and better. And depending on which side of the fence you're on, marriage is good or marriage is better. Depending on which side of the fence you're on, singleness is good or singleness is better. So he walks through singleness, he talks about fathers and daughters, and then he wraps up with this, the permanency of marriage. The permanency of marriage. I want us to look at the last two verses of, of this chapter. It says, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to marry whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. In addition to this word about singleness, it's not tacked on to Paul's discussion. Some, some Bible scholars go, well, you know, Paul was doing all this talking about singleness and this and that, and he had to thumbtack this on there. I want us to see that what Paul is talking about here is the permanency of the marriage relationship. The, the relationship is not permanent in the sense that it is eternal, but in the sense of it being lifelong. Marriage is binding as long as both partners are alive. And although uh, Christians with the gift of singleness are free to get married, they should keep in mind that when they do, they're bound before God with their mate uh, for uh, their rest of their lives. Okay? Um, now, if, the, if a particular partner is deceased, and I know in here it speaks of uh, the ladies, and if your husband dies, it works both directions here, Okay? So understand that. But if the partner is deceased, the believer is free to be married as long as the new partner is a believer in the Lord as well. The particular advice here is to widows, but it also applies to widowers. Two main points are here are this, that widowers, uh, the widowed 
believers are not bound to stay single, but if they do marry, they must remarry in the Lord. Okay, they need to marry another believer. There we go. All right. One step behind. <coughs> so, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, Paul might be saying here that remarriage is not a deal. It's not God's best for everyone. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Okay? It may not be the best for everybody. Some folks, when they are widowed or, or they're a widower, um, it's best for them to stay single. Some folks, uh, it doesn't work that well for them. And so they're much happier if, uh, if they are able to remarry. Paul's statement at the end of this is very interesting. He says, I think I also have the Spirit of God. It doesn't lessen the strength of his point, but it's kind of a touch of sarcasm, if you will. That he says uh, he has access to the leading of the Holy Spirit as well, and a claim apparently both group, uh, groups that advocated celibacy and the other group that advocated marriage only, they were saying, well, we have the Holy Spirit, so we must be right. And Paul's saying... If you're a believer, you all have the Holy Spirit, so that really doesn't weigh into the discussion. He was still speaking as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Where do we find that? Chapter 1, verse 1. As Paul opens the letter, he's writing to them and he says, I am writing to you as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And so he is laying out these directions. Okay? Now... All of that being said, I want to draw us right back here uh, at the end for a few thoughts for the singles, all right? So if you're single, okay, and I realize some of you are not, so you just get to free time to listen. All right, there you go. Uh, if you're single, Paul's words are addressed to you. Um, as we work our way through them here, you realize uh, that you haven't spent your time as you should. Maybe uh, if you're here and you're single and you say, you know what, uh, I've been focused on the wrong things, haven't been, haven't been spending my time as I should, uh, maybe uh, you need to see that you need to give attention to some things that you have not uh, done well. If your response to singleness has been unbiblical, turn around and make it count for Christ. And, and the way we're going to do that is three one word commands as we wrap this up this morning okay the first word is celebrate celebrate thank god for your singleness and enjoy it as his best for you at this time in your life god is sovereign amen we believe that god is sovereign so he is in control of your circumstances. And when the time comes, if the time comes, that God wants a change in your circumstances, he will bring that together. Amen? Boy, you know, we have a really weird attitude, especially those of us who are married, about singles. We see them go off to Bible college. And we say, enjoy your time at faith Baptist Bridal College. And then we're shocked if they would actually graduate and they're not married. Ooh, what's wrong with them? Could it possibly be that God is doing something different in their life than he did with, with some of us? Nod your heads like this, yes. Yes, it is possible celebrate if you're here and you're single praise god now move forward you say what do you mean well refocus refocus your energy instead of using them to look for a marriage partner or advance your career you should use them to totally give yourself to god absolute surrender you know, sometimes eh, preachers give invitations and come down and, and, and surrender your will to God. And, and, and as a married person, you can come down and surrender your will to God, but you might have a husband or a wife and some little crumb crunchers behind, and you got to kind of, 
work all of that in there? Man, a single person can walk an aisle, get on their face, and say, God, I'll do whatever you want to do. They're ready to go, amen? It's, and it's okay. Man, you guys look like your hair's blowed straight back. And Here's the last one. Relax. Relax. Now, this one fits all of us, okay? Whether you're married or you're single, quit hungering for the grass on the other side of the fence. Stay in your own pasture. Yeah, you know, for those that are single, yeah, maybe you're alone and, 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 and you're, you're not happy with that. Well, you need to get that squared away with God. But feed on the many benefits that God has for you right where you're at. Okay? Whether you're married or you're single, feed on the blessings that God has for you right there. The pasture of singleness can be the pasture of contentment if you will celebrate what God is doing in your life, if you'll refocus your heart's dreams and wants and desires upon God, and if you just relax and enjoy where God has you. Here's the bottom line. Whether you're single or you're married, again, serve the Lord. Amen? That's all God wants for you. Serve the Lord where you're at. Get happy about it. Well, you don't understand what the pressures of being single are. You're right, I'm married. Well, you don't understand how hard marriage is. Wrong, I'm married. I do know. And I do know that no matter what, we can glorify God, we can please God, we can serve God. Amen?